Anyone can build a website using Squarespace, the sponsor of this video. When you make metals hot, they start glowing red, kind of like coal or lava. If you make them hotter, they start turning orangish. This is an everyday phenomena. So the physics over here must also be pretty straightforward. Or is it? In the 1900s, the color of hot glowing things baffled even the greatest minds because it showed us that there was something fundamentally wrong with physics and it's what led Max Planck to quantum theory purely by accident. But what is so baffling about hot glowing things? Well, when I first learned about this in high school, the way I understood it was something something black body radiation, something something classical physics fails, ultraviolet catastrophe, oh no, and then something something Max Planck comes along, proposes E is equal to H nu and quantization and it solves everything and quantum theory is born. <laughs> but when I went into the college, I then started getting some details. In fact, I started getting too much details. I only got details of derivations and math and, and graphs and whatnot. And again, the big picture was lost. I, after all of this, I couldn't answer the fundamental question of why did hot glowing things break physics and how did it lead to the quantum theory? What is the intuition behind it? So for the past few days, I have been breaking my head, going over a lot of resources and even reading books for that matter. And I finally think I got some really, really strong intuition and I wanna share that with you. So this is uh, the first of a three-part video series where we're gonna intuitively rediscover the whole thing. And in this video, we're gonna, we're gonna see how it all started. What the heck is a black body? What's that gotta do with glowing things? And why did it baffle physicists back then? And in the next video, we'll try to attack this problem using the known laws of physics and rediscover the whole ultraviolet catastrophe. And finally, we will see how quantization solves it all. So if you're ready for this, let's begin. So we're gonna start with the biggest and the most fundamental question I had when I was reading this particular topic, and that is, why do we care about black bodies? And to answer that question, we're gonna talk to the man who started it all, Gustav Robert Kirchhoff. Kirchhoff, why do we care about black bodies? And Kirchhoff says, Mahesh, if you take an apple and you keep it in the sunlight, it gets hot, why? And I'm like, totally unrelated, but that's because the apple is absorbing all the sunlight and that energy is getting converted into thermal energy raising the temperature. And Kirchhoff is like, almost correct, but remember that apple is not absorbing all of the light. Some of the light is getting reflected, that's why you see the apple. But yes, the rest of the light is being absorbed, it's converting into thermal energy, and the temperature is raising. But that apple is continuously absorbing sunlight, and therefore its thermal energy should continuously increase, and so the temperature should continuously increase, eventually vaporizing the apple, right? But that doesn't happen, why not? And I'm like, with that, that is a beautiful question, Kirchhoff. I never even thought about it. So why doesn't it happen? Well, Kirchhoff says this could mean only one thing. Not only is that apple absorbing the sunlight that tends to increase the temperature, it must also be radiating it back that tends to decrease the temperature. And that's how the temperature stays steady. In other words, the apple is in thermal equilibrium. And therefore, that apple must not just be reflecting light, it must also be radiating light. It must be creating its own light. It must be glowing. And he called this the thermal radiation. Now, Kirchhoff has no idea what causes the thermal radiation because electrons were not discovered back then. But today, you and I know, thermal energy is basically jiggling electrons. And we know jiggling charges produces electromagnetic waves, and that's what causes thermal radiation. But Kirchhoff was able to argue purely from energy conservation point of view, and that I find is fascinating. It just goes to show how powerful energy conservation is. But anyways, this means Kirchhoff, that apple is glowing. It's producing its own light, right? And Kirchhoff says, not just the apple, Mahesh, everything around you, including you, me, and donkeys, we are all glowing. But then I'm like, if we are all glowing due to thermal radiation, why don't we see it? If I switch off the light, why don't you see me glowing? Ah, says Kirchhoff, well that's because you're not glowing in the visible region. At very low temperatures, like at room temperature, most of the radiation that we're giving out is in infrared region. And that's why our eyes cannot detect it. But if you use an infrared camera, then we can see it today. But now if you could increase the temperature to thousands of degrees Celsius, then we can see visible light coming out. And that's why, you know, metals glow red hot or coal or lava, they start giving you all that color. And then if we could increase the temperature even more to about say 10,000 degrees Celsius, now we'll start even getting ultraviolet light. And that's why welders, for example, need protection from ultraviolet light. 
And so the color of the thermal radiation depends on temperature. But whatever it is, we are all glowing. As long as you have temperature, we are all glowing due to thermal radiation. And I find this fascinating because, you know, in earlier, in primary school, we had learned about luminous objects like light bulb and sun that give out their own light and non-luminous objects like you and me and donkeys. But turns out we're all luminous, okay? All of us are actually giving out light. Just that we're not all giving out invisible spectrum. We're giving out mostly in the infrared light, but we're all luminous, we're all glowing, which is is super awesome. Now this is all great Kirchhoff, but the big question is why does it behave that way? I mean, why is it at low temperature I mostly give out just infrared and then at higher temperature start giving out visible and then even UV? And Kirchhoff says exactly Mahesh, that's exactly what the question I had and that's why I was urging the scientific community to do some research on black bodies because that way we will get to the bottom of this. But I'm like, wait a second, wait a second, what has this got anything to do with black bodies? Kirchhoff asks, Mahesh, you are now giving out thermal radiation. What does that depend on? And I'm like, it depends on temperature. We just talked about it. I'm giving out infrared light. Kirchhoff says, no, not just the temperature. See, if you're wearing clothes that are reflective, highly reflective of say infrared, then a lot of the infrared light that you're giving out, your body is giving out, will be reflected back and most of it will not make out. So the thermal radiation that finally comes out not only depends on the temperature, but also depends upon what you're wearing, how thick it is and all of that. But what if the clothes that you're wearing were 100% absorptive, zero reflections? Then all of that infrared will be completely absorbed and then re-emitted and now all of that infrared will come out. And now it will be independent of how thick that material is or what that material is made of. As long as it's 0% reflective, 100% absorptive, all of the thermal radiation will come out. In other words, if you had an object that was 100% absorptive, zero reflection, then the thermal radiation that comes out will have nothing to do with the surface feature, will have nothing to do with what the material is made of, it has nothing to do with anything except for temperature. Now the thermal radiation would be purely a function of temperature. In other words, we are staring at a fundamental law of nature. And I'm like, that's a very interesting way to put it, Kirchhoff, wow. But what kind of material would give you zero reflection, 100% absorption? Black bodies! And Kirchhoff says, no, 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 perfect black bodies. It's an idealized concept, a body that will not reflect anything. So even the, even the black objects that you have around you, they do reflect something. That's why they shine. That's why you can make out the surface feature. A perfect black body would not reflect anything, not in, nothing invisible, nothing in front, nothing in you, nothing at all. 100% absorbent. And the thermal radiation provided, produced by a perfect black body would only depend on temperature. That was the big deal. And that's why Kirchhoff was urging the scientific community to do research on that. That's why hot glowing things was a very interesting subject. So putting it all together, Kirchhoff loved perfect black bodies because the thermal radiation that they would give out would purely depend on temperature. So analyzing it would be analyzing a fundamental law of physics. So what happened next? And Kishov is like, for the next 20 years, nothing happened. <laughs> and I'm like, why not? And Kishov says, what do you mean, why not? Mahesh, it's the 1860s. We don't have the technology to do any of these experiments yet. But in the early 1900s, we finally started doing experiments on perfect black bodies. And I'm like, wait a second, wait a second. What do you mean we finally started doing it? Perfect black bodies do not exist. How can you do experiments with perfect black bodies? Turns out we found an ingenious way to actually build a perfect black body. It's kind of like an ingenious tool that we use to build websites today. Squarespace, the sponsor of this video. I call it ingenious because first of all, you can get started for free, but more importantly, both professionals and amateurs like me can build incredibly amazing websites. How does it cater to both of us? If you don't know anything about building websites kind of like me, then you can pick this option where you can use ready-made templates. You can choose what kind of website you want to build and then pick one of the templates that you like and it'll give you a skeleton. And here comes the good part. Just by clicking buttons, you can hyper customize it to your liking. You can tweak every single thing and tailor it to your perfection. But what if you are a professional and you don't want to use templates? Well, then you can click this other option because here you get to build everything from scratch. Ingenious, isn't it? And yes, you can check various kinds of data in their analytics sections to see how your website is doing. You can use their dedicated support if you ever get stuck. You can even buy and manage domains directly from Squarespace. But what's really awesome is you can get started for free by going to squarespace.com slash floateheadphysics. And yes, if you decide to make a purchase, you can even save 10% by using the promo code 
floated physics at the checkout. All right, back to hot glowing things. Again, how exactly do we build a perfect black body? Well, in from the 1890s to 1900s, there were a ton of people who did a lot of research, both experimentally and theoretically. So let's talk to one of the prominent ones, Otto Lohmer. Mr. Lohmer, how exactly do you build a perfect black body? It's an ideal thing. How do you build one? Lohmer says, using a hole in a box. And I'm like, what? Take a hollow metallic cube, with the walls painted black and put a hole on one of the face in, in one of the faces. Now that cube is certainly not a perfect black body because it's going to reflect a lot of light. But what about that hole? If you shine light into that hole, there's a good chance that light is pretty much lost inside. It'll be absorbed. The chance of that light coming back out of that hole is almost zero. In other words, that hole is pretty much 100% absorptive, zero reflective. That hole acts like a perfect black body. And I'm like, wait a second, that's cheating. That's a hole, it's not a thing. And Lomar says, Mahesh, remember what Kishav taught us? It doesn't matter what that material is made of. That is irrelevant. As long as you have something that is 100% absorptive, 0% reflective, it is a perfect black body. Its thermal radiation would purely be a function of temperature. That hole is pretty much 100% absorptive, 0% reflective. So that hole, nothing else, just that hole, acts like a perfect black body. So if you heat the whole metal up to very high temperatures and look at the radiation that's coming out from the hole, not from the rest of the cube, but just from the hole and analyze it, that would be thermal radiation of a perfect black body. And that's exactly what they did. And I'm like, Loomer, along with your friends, please take a bow because that is incredible. Remember, we're talking about the 1900s. They found a way to create a perfect black body. And this is one of the reasons why I think we should, when we're learning physics or any subject for that matter, we should dive deep into the experimental details because it's gonna give us a lot of insights and it's gonna help us appreciate the subject even more. But the big question now was, what are the findings of this experiment? Well, the findings can be summarized by drawing a graph. Yes, this is the famous black body radiation graph, where on the x-axis, we're gonna plot the wavelengths, which you can loosely think of it as colors. And on the y-axis, we're gonna plot the intensity, which you can loosely think of it as the brightness of the different colors that are coming out. So Lomer, what did we find? Lomer says, first of all, at whatever temperature you choose, the thermal radiation will always contain all the colors of light. That means that right now, you, me, and donkeys, we're not just radiating in infrared, we are radiating invisible. We are also glowing in ultraviolet. We're glowing and giving out all the colors of light, which is pretty awesome if you think about it. But the reason why you cannot see me is, I mean, when in, in the dark, for example, why don't I glow in the dark? You can't see me, is because not all the different colors have the same brightness. They do not have the same intensity. Turns out, at room temperature, the graph looks like this you can immediately see the amount of ultraviolet and the visible that we're all giving out is negligible, it's almost zero. It's there, but it's almost zero. But most of the intensity is in the infrared, far right infrared region. And that's why at room temperature, we mostly give out infrared light. But what happens if we increase the temperature? Well, let's increase it to say about 2,500 degrees Celsius. What does the graph look like? It looks like this. You can see the graph is now so big it goes out of bounds, we can't even see it anymore. And that's because at higher temperatures you have more thermal energy and so the thermal radiation is much higher. And so all the colors of light will now get more intensity. But if we scale down the graph, we rescale the graph, you can now see that this time, although the graph has become bigger, now the, a lot of visible light is coming out. This is because the peak has shifted to the left. That's the that's one of the key things over here. And this is the reason why when we heat up metals, for example, you now see them glowing reddish because now visible light comes out mostly in the red end of the spectrum. And if we increase the temperature even more, the same thing happens. The peak shifts even more left and now a lot of visible light starts coming out. I mean, still you're getting a lot of infrared that's there, but now almost all the colors of the light, visible light is also coming out and now the object will look pretty much whitish and that's what happens to the sun the sun has a temperature about 5500 degrees celsius and that's why it glows white i mean it looks yellow to us because of the atmosphere but if you went outside the atmosphere and looked at it the sun is pretty much white because that's the spectrum of the sun and of course if you increase the temperature even more the peak shifts to the left even more and now we get a lot of uv 
But the ultimate question is, why does the graph look like this? Why is it at low temperatures, we mostly get infrared, and then as the temperature increases, the peak starts shifting to the left and you start getting more and more visible in UV. That was something that people were trying to figure out. And in order to do that, people studied the graphs even more and they came up with some results, some very interesting results. The first one is the Stefan Boltzmann's law, we call it. They figured out that the area under this graph, which is basically the total intensity given out by all the colors of light at a particular temperature, is proportional to the fourth power of that temperature. This is the reason why when we increase the temperature, the graph blows up and scales up so quickly because a little increase in the temperature will give out a lot more output power. Another brilliant analysis was done by a scientist named William Wien. He figured out that the wavelength that corresponds to the peak intensity, it's inversely proportional to the absolute temperature. Again, that kind of makes sense when you look at the graph, as the temperature increases, as we saw, the peak shifts to the left. So that's exactly what they're saying. But he figured out that it was actually inversely proportional to the temperature. And he also figured out what that proportionality constant is. Now these two laws do not explain why the graph is the way it is, but I find them fascinating because we can do some pretty cool things with that. For example, by using the Wien's displacement law, I can now look at the temperature, at, at the spectrum of the sun, figure out what the peak wavelength is, and from that, I can figure out what the temperature of the sun is. That's how we know today that the sun's surface temperature is about 5,500 degrees Celsius. How cool is that? And not just that, now, that, now that I know the temperature of the sun, I can use the Stefan Boltzmann's law to figure out what is the total energy that the sun is giving out. And then I can figure out how much of that energy Earth is receiving. And then if I build a solar panel, I can then estimate how much electricity I can produce just by using solar power. I mean, this is just mind boggling. But here's what's really mind blowing. Guess what's the most perfect black body that we have access to today? Just, just guess. Well, it's the cosmic microwave background. Yes, the remnants of the Big Bang. Turns out it perfectly matches the black body radiation curve with its peak wavelength lying in the microwave region. And again, I can use the Wien's displacement law to figure out what its temperature is. The temperature turns out to be insanely low. So black body radiation isn't just a theoretical concept. It's the key to unlocking the deepest mysteries of the universe. It tells us that everything is glowing. It helps us figure out the temperature of the stars and it allows us to analyze the oldest light from the Big Bang itself. But, but the ultimate question is, why does the graph look like this? When we try to attack this problem using classical physics, we ran into a catastrophe, which we'll explore in a video here. And then we will see how quantization saved the day in the video over here. I'll see you.